you to turn your volume up so that I hear you better? I mean, nothing other than me putting the mic in front of me. I guess I guess I don't really need to not do that because I'm not, I don't have a controller in front of me. I'll check on my side see if there's anything I can do. You're always quiet when you come Hey, right, welcome back to another week of the Anime for All podcast. I am here with the spear, the magic helmet. Not sure yeah, if it's just the spear things. or the magic helmet, but I guess we're here with both. Um, respective, respective spear, fear the helmet. That's what I always say. Well, you gotta hear respect the spear and helmet. Okay, um. Yeah, you know, I said respect the spear, but fear the helmet. Wouldn't you want people to respect the helmet and fear the spear? No, because the helmet, the spear is just a spear. The helmet is magic. Isn't the spear magic? It's not magic spear and helmet. It's spear and magic helmet. Fair point. You just, as you were reading your name out, I literally looked at it. <laughs> if you look on my Twitch page, it says respect the spear, spear the helmet. That's been my logo, my uh, tagline ever since I started Twitch. I'm not huh. kidding. No, I know. I, I'm not. I know you're not kidding. I'm just. I was like, huh. I never thought about it. <laughs> Did you say it out loud like that? I was like, oh, huh. Interesting. That actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um. Last week. Usually we talk- comes up when I'm playing uh, Shell Shock more than anything else. Oh, really? So we will comment on the danger of my spear or my helmet or something, and then I'll, I'll throw that tagline out. And then nobody really has anything to say because it's not a very good tagline. But I'm, I'm committed to it now. It'd be like if my tagline was Tee No, that's Digi's tagline. No, his is Keep It Digital. 
It's also tee hee because he uses that a lot. <laughs> He's laughing because he knows it's true. <laughs> it is. It's very true. Um. Okay. Last week we talked about two episodes of My Hero Academia. This week we're changing things up. We're finally getting back to uh, Dragon Prince. Well, I guess you better unsubscribe because I don't got that for you. <laughs> All right. Just curious if you're watching your feed. What? I was just curious if you're watching your feed or not. Yeah, I'm always watching my feed. Uh, wow, that literally threw me off track. <laughs> uh, yeah, as anything like that, though. <laughs> he's not wrong. Um, oh, that's right. We're, uh, we're talking about a uh, recent episode of My Hero Academia and also a uh, the, uh, the episode of C- uh, episode 7 of Dragon Prince. Before we actually get on with it, I want to bring something. Um, I think it was during the weekend. I actually, uh, as I was watching the episode and also beforehand I was watching the episode, I started thinking about like, how much overhaul kind of got uh, overhyped. Uh, haha. Mm-hmm. I actually threw out a tweet um, on my Twitter actually asking all my Hero Academia fans to just to gauge if what I thought was correct or not, or if I'm in the wrong to think this way, but I actually had asked, am I wrong to think that yes. um, Overhaul, wow, am I wrong to think that Overhaul was overhyped? Um, it was specifically, that was specifically the question, and apparently, not that I got responses, I got retweets. Um, you got what? I got retweets, or heart, or likes for that comment. So, I think I'm not in. I'm not in a minority. Oh, I'm, I might be in the minority with that one, but at the same time, there are people who think that. Apparently, I mm-hmm. think Overhaul might have been like overly hyped in terms of like his importance. Granted, he did get out in the episode prior, so there's always a chance that I guess he'll come back. I don't. Mm-hmm. I. I actually don't look forward to that. I even put that in the tweet too. I was like, I, I, even as he's out now, I am. I don't like the idea that he's vying for another arc surrounding him. But do you think that there's a parallel between Dobby and Todoroki, where Dobby has just a firepower, but it's really, really strong, and Todoroki has fire and it's opposite of ice, whereas uh, Shigaraki has. A disintegrating power that's extremely powerful, and Overhaul has a disintegrating power that's not as powerful, but he can also reconstitute. Is it a motif that they're setting up in the show? I think there's a parallel between uh, Toya and Shoto, but I don't think it's their powers. I think it's just more of like, I mean, Shoto said this before, I was like, and I kind of agree with him a little bit. Um, when you go back to Shoto season two, when we first introduced to him fully in terms of interacting with him finally for the first time, he brings up the mm-hmm. fact that Toya is essentially just how he was, and but it's way more out of control. Um, and he's like, you know, this is he's kind of how I how I was, which is kind of interesting that he said he's kind of how he was instead of how he is. Um, still don't really know how. How, where Shoto is on his father, um, and thinks this episode we still don't know. Which actually, I want to, I want to, I want to bring up a complaint. <laughs> you have a complaint, complaints it's, department. It's a, uh, it's about the title of the episode. It is not the hellish family Todoroki. It, th- th- I spent it a story backstory finally, and we get a hint that we're gonna get that only at the end of the episode. The entire episode, we weren't really just on endeavor. I have a complaint. <laughs> I want to lodge a complaint about the title. That was mislabeled. That is my major complaint. Also, I guess as a full disclaimer, I had no control over what Spear is going to say uh, about Endeavor in this entire episode. Just for a disclaimer. Any Endeavor mm-hmm. fans out there that know you exist, you might want to just walk away from the podcast. I suspect there's going to probably be some... I told you I was right about Endeavor coming up in a few minutes. Just want to just, I just want to prepare people. <laughs> I've been preparing You're myself right for, for a couple of days now because I was expecting him to. What are you talking now? You're right about what? No, you, I'm expecting you to hear from you. Oh, yeah. I'm expecting you to hear it from you. 
That's what I would say. I, I, I'm just preparing for Endure fans I'm that I'm. Just, I've been times. preparing myself for this moment because I like I've had a couple of days. I was like, oh great. Well, this is it's not that I care that much. I do like Endeavor, but at the same time, I, I'm expecting that if if there's anything, if this, this episode might do really bad in the ratings. Just preparing everybody. <laughs> Preparing. Huh? Is it hard being wrong? I've never been wrong before. I've always wondered. Okay. Um. Well, we're gonna uh do do do. So we're gonna start with episode 129 or episode 15 of My Hair Academia. Um. I want to say that this entire episode encompasses the aftermath, which is what we'll be dealing. We'll be we've honestly been dealing with these last few episodes after the. Honestly, call it a failure of of of, of um a failure of a. Uh, of of um not a war but like a coup d'etat or whatever you want to call it it's like they were trying to get to the villains take them out before they did need any real damage but unfortunately mm -hmm. that didn't didn't come out unscathed so we're dealing with the aftermath and it's gotten it's gotten the show that's really it's 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 really bad and i guess before i let you talk i want to say um as this episode was going on, I actually enjoyed uh, a lot of the, the world building again that they've been doing, such as sh showing that the heroes definitely didn't get uh, out unscathed, e even if they did take um, a little, th not, not as much damage. Yeah, some deaths definitely happened, but I can say they could probably get by with some of the heroes that they lost. Yeah, and who gives a shit about Midnight? Wow. Oh. Or Shield Hero. I liked Midnight, but um. Oh, I do too. Oh my God, you're right. Good characters died after all. That's no, that can't be what you meant. What I meant was that the characters that they lost, as as cool as they were, in the grand scheme of things, they could get by without them. Oh, and yeah. it's not it's not that like it's not that they can't progress. Is that what you say when they show the deaths from like 911 and stuff? You're like, oh, we can get by without them. I don't think you can. Yeah. Equate, I don't think you can equate 9/11 to, to yeah, this. Not a lot of people brought 9/11, but we can get by without him. I don't think we can, you can equate 9/11 to, to this. It's a disaster. It's a disaster that involved tons of deaths, and you're just like, yeah. I don't think there's that many deaths. <laughs> what about the entire freaking city that was destroyed? I don't think that many civilians were killed. I, I could be wrong because I, I, I was trying to tell them to catalog the amount of people they lost, but they haven't done that yet, which is weird. I guess mm -hmm. they're still trying to rescue people. I mean, who knows? They they live in the world full of heroes. Um, if they're being completely fair. They can get by without those heroes. So I'm not trying to silence it. I'm just saying that these heroes that they definitely did die, they will be missed. I'm very upset they killed Midnight. Still, that's still something that will probably remain in the back of my mind for the rest of the show. Um, yeah, hit you. Um, that's where it really counts. What? Nothing. I, I rarely listen to these podcasts back. But I'm probably gonna, like, once we're done with this and this is released, I'm probably gonna listen to this, <laughs> this part of the podcast. <laughs> just to hear what you just said to me. In a couple of days, if you ban me from Discord, I'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, But, uh, beginning of the episode, we start off. With a reminder that uh, Deku is in a coma. Um, pretty much, this is too big of a deal because this is typically how they kind of bench the main character. They put him out of commission in in a really weird way. Either they send him off the planet. Hmm? We don't really need him anyway. They can get they can do without him. I don't agree with that statement, but we don't have all might, so. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, speaking of all, man, we can just talk about this because it's kind of a random still that you kind of throw in the middle near the end of the episode. I like how uh, all the, the world's going to going to going to heck in a handbasket. Um, nobody trusts heroes anymore. They got that all my statue. They threw a sign over it saying, "I am not here." I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I want to point out too in the opening credits, all my only appears just for a second. In the intro, it's an, he's in the background at about a minute and one second into the episode. That's his only appearance in the entire intro this time. A, 
Are you talking about the the song, the intro song? Yeah, the the opening credits. Yeah. Oh, I was I was I was so confused. Like, I thought you didn't watch that. Um. Hmm. Okay. Well, if he knows about what's I going on in the intro. Credits to see it. He's only in that one moment. Like Uraraka gets more screen time than he does. They don't show the statue of him. They don't show. Deku looking forward and seeing him. They don't show like a little doll of him. He's just in the background at 101, like looking sort of, I don't know, befuddled <laughs> as he looks at Deku. Uh, what do you think of that scarf? That is obviously Gran Torino's scarf. I didn't notice that. That's cool to see. That's cool to hear, but I didn't notice it. Well, it's obviously his scarf. <laughs> no, it just didn't register to me. I just saw a scarf and didn't think deeply about it. But, uh, okay. But yeah, we get that little reminder that Deku's out. Let me stick to let me stick to the credits just for a second. That scene after um, All Might disappears, do you see that scene at around 138 of the episode where there's this, like, white creature, like, kind of ambiguous that morphs into something much more human? I mean, I think that's just uh, all for one. Like, in the past, or like that. Or at least linked to so? all for one. I, I I will back off and say that it's all for one. I'm gonna say it's probably linked to him. I thought it was more likely Shigaraki in, in his uh, test tube thing. Or well, I was still right. Linked. I mean, it's linked to all for one. <laughs> no, it's definitely not all for one because if you look at the scene, no, I said Alan, I, I backed off on that and said linked to, linked to all for one. Could be, but there's a scene that follows. But Shigaraki is still linked to him though. I mean, no matter what, I was I was right. <laughs> oh, fine. But will you let me finish the sentence, or did you want to keep interrupting me? You think that interrupts I mean, yes. Me? I mean, I mean, so we, we keep the we keep the episode interrupt. going. I mean, sorry. Shut up. And I politely, politely put the bag of Rito, Doritos aside so I wouldn't interrupt the podcast for the bunch of Franklin. And I just I just rolled them up and pinned it because. Why the hell not? If we're interrupting each other, there's no sound quality. Shut up. <laughs> the scene after that, you see this weird, like, concrete urban landscape where, like, there's a chunk taken out of it and you can see some sort of scaffolding underneath. And it goes on for a long time. And you see characters fighting them. What I think is interesting about that is I assume that that is representative Shigaraki and his transformation that he's going through because he doesn't look particularly happy about what's happening to him as he's going through that. But what it reminded me of immediately when I noticed it, because I didn't notice this the first time I walked through, it was just like a quick detail. Have you ever seen the movie Pink Floyd's The Wall? Uh, no, sorry, I'll still mute it. I'm sorry, what? There's a big hum, big background hum on your mic now. It wasn't there before you muted. What? All right, it just went away. Um, so in this scene here where they show the, the uh, evolution of whatever that white creature is, that then battles everybody in the next scene that doesn't really have any distinct facial features, reminded me immediately of the movie Pink Floyd's The Wall. Have you seen that? No, I said that before. No, I said okay. obviously no. The in Pink Floyd's Law, there's it's a mostly a live action show, but there's a lot of animation that the band made themselves, and most of the animation has something to do with like a transformation or a metamorphosis of some kind. The main character in Pink Floyd's The Wall is usually represented either by a white doll with no distinguishing characteristics or as some iteration of that white doll. Like, it could be, like, twisted or it could be, like, transforming into something, but it always, like, the white doll is, like, the baseline. Like, this indescript, indescript, nondescript white figure that, like, is constantly going through that. But like I said, the whole, every animated scene that they have, and there's 17 minutes of them in the show, is always involving, like, something metamorphosizing and twisting into something more horrible than it. But the interesting thing about this comparison to the wall, because the wall was 
if you counted it as an animated movie in the same way that like, like Roger Rabbit is an animated movie, would probably will be one of the top animated movies of all time because The Wall was one of the greatest selling CDs of all time. Um, I'm checking to see the best selling albums of all time on Wikipedia and see where The Wall stands. But if you had a list of 100, I'd be amazed if it wasn't on there. Um, so each disc is in a multi-disc set of sounds counted as one unit towards certification. Um, so that throws things off a little bit, but the wall sold the CD, like the disc, the album, sold 30 to 39 million copies. Um, and it's one of the top a glance here because it doesn't have a num it's not numbered but it's one of roughly the top 30 albums of all time for selling like up there with the beatles and madonna and michael jackson and you know what i mean metallica led zeppelin like obvious household names pink floyd the wall is like one of the greatest selling albums of all time hands down and the movie was very popular by extension um so it's very hard to think that a show with such roots in the history of animation, especially in the United States, and an understanding sort of a, of the animation in the United States would not be familiar with this foundational piece of animated work because it was brilliant and like very, very popular. Um, so it's hard to look at this, like this metamorphosizing creature and not think about the wall. The interesting thing about The Wall, as I mentioned earlier briefly, is that it was a psychological movie about somebody that was trapped inside of themselves with a history of abusive parents and is slow, like, and nobody loved him and is slowly going mad over the course of, this, of the show. And he's trapped behind a wall that he's built around himself and everything is trying to break through and take him over. And taking him over in the movie is represented by, I think, him going, losing his mind or perhaps suicide. Um, but it's interesting to see that kind of a template and then see this animation and know where the plot's going right now that Shigaraki needs to be saved. And then think about Pink Floyd with a little doll character that's like kind of helpless and being jerked around right now to the point where like some of the one of the characters in the show dangles him around like a marionette, like puppet. And then think about how Shigaraki is slowly becoming more and more puppet-like, like the doll was in the wall that was isolating itself, like Shigaraki is trying to do to protect himself from um, All for One so that he won't become a puppet and be judged when the wall is torn down. Um, it's a very, a movie that's very focused on violence, sexuality and drugs too, but like there's a lot of violence, war and blood animations and things like that in there. And it just feels like if there was five things that ins inspired the personality of Shigaraki, the wall, the wall's animations might have been one of them. I think you might be grasping with that one. I don't know. Like it's, a, it's just. A t I'm pretty sure something is. Part, I just don't know. Like if like. If anything, it's like I feel like if there was anything directly inspiring this show, it's just like superheroes and stuff like that. I don't know if I would grant you the a CD or the, not a CD, but the um the music video. I guess you would say or set of episodes you saw would be one of the things that inspired this. I don't, especially I mean the it was the guy was in Japan. I I don't know what he's seen or not seen, um, but uh. Well, we know he's actually seen... on top of that. He was he's the one animating it. It's the Studio Bones, the people who animate this. And as far as I'm aware, Studio Bones is totally in Japan. I don't even know if there's even any recollection of them online at all. Oh, look at that animation company. There's a lot of scenes like that. I mean, I, I knew when I did this, I was talking to Jesse and he's just going to disagree with me. But um, he is used as a puppet in it. He is. Um, brought up as, you know, someone with very abusive parents that took terrible care of him. Yeah, but I felt like, I don't know, I would recognize him as that, that little thing as, I'm not saying it can't be, I just, I just don't think I, I, I personally would recognize him as 
Shigaraki, because Shigaraki's hair is way longer. Even if you were to put him into the cocoon, I still don't see it matching him. The doll character and the white figure that's fighting everybody in the next panel, both of those characters aren't... Um, it looks like they're really... fighting Deku to me in the next panel. It, it looked like the entire like little sequence that was shown there, it looked like they were fighting Deku. But there were heroes fighting him. Yeah, but it still looked like they were fighting Deku. Mm. It looked like Deku was like at the center of it all, and they were go going towards him. Because even if you, you talk with Araka, it looked like for whatever reason in those scenes, it all looked like Deku was like the cause of a lot of the darkness. Except for the portion of where Deku and Shigaraki, for whatever reason, kind of like get hit with the light. And Deku's mask comes flying off his face, but also for Shigaraki, he just turns into that little boy that we saw at the very beginning of the, of the show. Out of that little scene. Can I show you a gift that reminded me of that panel as well? Um, where you start with this like nondescript white figure and it gets more and more like sentient looking and then it's kind of like screaming at the end of it. If you look at this scene that I just sent you, this gif in the Discord chat. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Do you see how it like, it starts with its head down and it raises up and it's like morphing as it raises up and by the time it reaches the top it has pupilless eyes you can see it's sort of human looking teeth and there's some marks around the mar marks around the top lips like cross hatched lines not cross hatched lines but like parallel lines and it's suddenly very like raw and visceral where it started out abstract and, and kind of bubbly animation and it feels like this scene in particular I think came to mind when I saw the wall like that scene with that little character that like sort of starts out white and nondescript like little character and it twists into a monster please check with mommy honey she's in the bedroom Greg sorry no, no problem cool. Um, but if you look at this character, the way it twists and it morphs as it's going and it starts with its head down and bent over and then it just like raises up full height and screams up into the air, it looks like that moment to me. It makes me feel like that moment. And like I said, there's a there's good parallels to be drawn between the character's men mentality in the wall and like where things go from there like shigaraki's like mind could fit very well into the world of the wall and like again the marionette scene is like hard to ignore too when the schoolmaster like pulls him dances him around like a puppet I, I could see it but at the same time it's like i still again it's like where i was like i don't want to unless the person unless they had like the people in the studio came out with it Though I mean, I also am not naive enough to think that you know, like they, like not everybody, if, if an, you know, if an inspiration is going to come out with everything that inspired them. But I'm mean, right we don't now. Have to hmm? Put it in like we don't have to carve it into marble that like it's absolutely true. But if, I'm I'm observing that it feels like sort of a parallel there. What year did it come out? What the wall? Yeah. Um, probably like 1976. The Studio of Bones Check. was founded in 98. Um, 1982 is when it was released. So it could have been something like that one of the, like the story writer was like familiar with even from like college or something like that. Because anyone that studied animation, the wall would have been one of the early pieces of highly creative artwork. And it was very like celebrated for the um the artwork stuff he sure would have been you know, it would have been shown in like a in this japanese college i know some things well, cross boundaries but I don't, I don't know i mean i guess i haven't seen well this little bit. A, somebody that's sort of an enthusiast about u.s animated culture it'd be surprising if he didn't have at least one day where he like sat down and flipped it on because it's it's foundational it's like a foundational work that was very important well i mean well the creator of the, of the manga maybe but like the studio of bones is like a bunch of people well even then some of them could have been influenced by it but i mean the manga creator is the one that like probably came out with some of these designs right 
I mean, yeah, he created the story, but I like, I mean, animators can take liberties. <laughs> So there seems to be there seems to be a lot of studios with this company too. So who does my hero? I'm just I mean, right we now. Oh, Studio C. We know the writer has um has a distraction with somebody having multiple characters that live in their mind, just like the uh, character in the wall does. We know that the that psychological development and twisting and themes of schizophrenia and and alternate like alternate existences of the mind like alternate states of the consciousness are like a big deal to this character because i mean to the writer because we see those things explored in great detail like all for one and one for all and the twisted states of the nomus and the way the nomus all look different is very consistent with the walls kind of animation style that there's all these like twisted like facsimiles of living characters in there it's it's just really like it's really of an earlier cloth in in a lot of style if, if it didn't direct influence them directly it influenced them indirectly because the anthropomorphic and metamorphic like animation that was in there is like it's just tied in perfectly with like the kind of things that we see here I mean, I mean, yeah. There's definitely a lot, a lot going on in there. I just, I'm like looking I'm at, like... I'm looking. I mean, I'm trying to see. I know you probably wouldn't directly if you, if you probably wouldn't know how to say it in Japanese, but and I guess you wouldn't, you wouldn't exactly directly. I guess reference something. I guess that that old. I can't sit there and say that it can't be. Well, it'd be hard for someone that was that age to have not grown up at least hearing about it even in japan like it's a british movie it's not an american movie but like i said it's extremely high up there i'm just like looking at the actual creator kohei uh orokoshi i probably butchered that name please people don't come after me i I'm, i don't speak japanese i would like to but i don't um all i really know is i mean marvel comics i mean here apparently he's also a fan of marvel comics so i mean that was obvious uh, apparently he was influenced by a manga artist by, called Yuko Asada, but there's no nothing on, on, on the internet about this Yuko. But um, he also graduated from it was possibly maybe that university he went to, Nagoya University of Arts. Probably if it did, if it if it is that that influential, maybe they did show it in there. Again, I can't say I can't say no or yes to any any of this. I guess it's just a maybe. And this core question says, other than the Beatles, which Western bands were popular in the Jap Japan during the 60s and 70s? Hmm? It says, other than the Beatles, what bands were popular in the 60s and 70s in Japan? And then Pink Floyd is on the list. I guess maybe the animators influence the animators, but I don't think because I don't even know if this is even something that shows up in the manga. It'd be funny if it does, but I don't, I don't even know because it isn't I'm looking at the I look at the creature, I mean regardless of what he's meant to represent, it's like it doesn't look like Jerry Rocky, no matter what no matter how I turn my head. Even in Metamorphosis, he would, he would, he still, look, he, it still looked look like it should be coming out of Shigaraki, but it doesn't look like it was coming out of him at all. Like, I'm literally looking at it right now. I mean, we'll move on, but I just, like... Could be him? I didn't even think about it when he popped up. I, would, I just, it was a really weird thing, but I, I mean, I see the, I see the similarity between the animation you have here. But, um... Yeah. That's all I can see. Like, as far as this being something about Shigaraki, it's like... I don't think it's a hundred percent. I think it's an influence, an influence from like an academic level influence that um, somebody might have gotten from the show. And like I said, it's it trails. It doesn't just have to be. I mean, a lot of times the things in intro songs don't ever really one hundred percent translate into what's going to happen in this show. Uh, I also want to just say that too. I'm going to make it my quest to convince you of this. 
I'm talking about the entirety of the intro. I'm just saying, like, I mean, usually it's like all just like a music video or whatever. It, it doesn't. It's not really meant to be. It shows up in the show. Cause they do this a lot. I mean, like it's they don't include anything in the show. show, huh? It's supposed to be a thematic but not spoiler teaser of things that are happening in the show, and I think it has that feeling. You know that like that's what they're going for here is like a thematic but non teaser um moment so i think if you look at it that way then sure right i mean i guess but i'm just i'm sitting here and my brain is literally trying to rationalize this is sugar rocky and i i like I, I think what is happening is my brain is trying to look at it in terms of like this is it's it's him but i can't other than the scar that is clearly on his like left eye, like everything else is like to me, it's making my brains like this is not Shigaraki. Would you say that in a sense, Shigaraki is being treated like a doll right now? I mean, yes, but also in what sense? You mean being taken care of for a social, uh, you know, for one takes full control over him or something? Being treated well, a doll in Japan is usually a vessel for something. So we have to like take the American interpretation of this and sort of switch it over to how it would be seen in Japan. And dolls are usually something that can be possessed or controlled or taken over or infused with demons or something like that. And if you think of it that way, and you think of what seems to be all for one's goal right now of taking, um, Shigaraki and turning him into his like vessel. Oh wait a minute! I didn't even see Shigaraki in that intro where they were fighting. What the heck? Right. I, I just I literally just went and watched it. There is somebody and it looks like it's Shigaraki from there. Like, really? The pale skin, oh, everything like matches his skin color and everything. I had assumed that they were fighting Deku, but that scene no, did confuse true. me. But I mean, we're saying Shigaraki, but it could be all for one easily, too. But somebody, but I mean, somebody with, with massive power, but the only two villains that have that kind of power right now is all for one in Shigaraki. Check out this moment, too. Oh, I can't show you screenshots. It's exactly at 155 in mine. There's a scene of Deku. I can share my screen with you, like, in a literal sense, but I still don't think it would show up as a screen capture. At 155 exactly, there's a very, very quick flash of a scene where Deku's green mask, that like silly kind of green mask that he used to wear early on, is on, and there's like a metal support thing on, and his face looks like it's a green mask with like metal teeth. I, I, I'm aware. I'm I'm aware. I'm, I mean, I'm not gonna. I, I've already seen that scene. I'm not gonna really tell you what I know about that scene, but I'm aware of what you're okay. talking about. It's just thrown on there, and then like he emerges, and then you see as soon as they're done with that, you see Shigaraki, and he lifts up, and the um, the the white thing blows away, and there's a little boy underneath that. So that builds into my idea of the doll, the doll being representative of a person, you know what I mean, but not really the person itself. And then you. You have the white wall that's constantly in the wall, like represented as surrounding the doll and, and, and shielding it from the world. And you have the monster of Shigaraki there, like shielding the little boy from the world. Um, there's a lot of things in this that could be interpreted as being parallel to the wall. If nothing else, it's an interesting way to think about it. That, like he sheds his white coating or in, in the wall, the doll sheds its wall you know, the white wall, and there's like something behind it, you know, there's something underneath the surface. There's a monster on the outside and something innocent on the inside. And with Deku, you see the green monster with the metal teeth and the scarf. And then you see immediately following that, as if it, in parallel, you see Shigaraki with his monstrous form that's a, that's a white form. And then that sheds away and there's an innocent boy underneath that too. And that, if that's not, equally able to be paralleled by the main character in the wall which is like this little boy that's sort of a victim of everything in his world and has shielded himself off with dark things and evil like the wall is not like a real wall it's it's made out of his pain in the wall like it's made out of his pain 
in the trauma of losing his father and the abuse of his mother and the mistreatment of him in different parts of his life. And it's, it's made out of drugs and it's made out of wanton sex and money and, and vices. And it's made out of horrible things. It's not made out of anything good. Like it's made out of terrible things. And when he's put on trial, they tear down the wall. And all that's left is that little character that's defenseless against all these things because it was building the wall out of all those things in the first place. And it, some sort of oblivion or, or insanity hits it as a result. They don't make it clear. So, and the scenes where they show the child, the, the doll alone, like they show things like him falling through the sky or, or laying limply and helplessly within his wall. And like they don't, when they actually show the doll, like it, it usually looks fairly helpless. It looks like a marionette. So, and something to be preyed upon or grounded in the meat or something like that. It's very much like a helpless victim that, that's surrounded by all these pains of war and all the other dark things that happen in there. So it's, it just feels very sugar rocky to me. The more I talk about it, the more I convince myself that there's at least some fun to think about parallels there. Uh, me, I will give this to you because apparently you're fighting for it. I mean, I can see the similarities for sure. Um, I was listening and wasn't really coming to my own opinions. That's, that's like what's happening right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, can I show you one other thing? And this is even more of a stretch and you're gonna be in the way with me. Do you yeah. know the Pink Floyd, like, standard logo of the prism? Are you familiar with it? I've never, like, I've, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how many times I gotta say it, I don't, I don't think I know anything about Pink, Pink Floyd. Uh, I mean. So the prism shows a ray of light hitting the prism, like the triangle, and then splitting into a rainbow, and here it is. If that couldn't be a loose symbol for the difference between all for one and one for all, I don't know what it is. I mean, all the powers coming together for one cause, one person taking all the powers for himself. I mean, in in, I mean, in theory, I mean that could that, that I mean that could work. Everything and the line on the left is everything. All the colors compressed into a single beam, and then it hits the prism, and it becomes. The single beam spread out into a rainbow of different colors, which would mean something very different as far as being inspirational. All for one being the beam that has all colors pushed into it, but is also colorless and bland looking. And one for all being the rainbow, which is inspirational and uplifting. And yet they're the same thing. Man, I agree this could be a, 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 I don't know what it's called, a syllogism. That's not the right word. Symbol, Im, Im, symbolism there for that. Metaphor. Again, I don't know where he came up with. I thought of an awful one and one for all. I kept thinking about the female criteria. So, I mean, this probably makes way more sense with came in my brain. So, I mean. The reason that's even more of a stretch is because that prism is very often associated with Pink Floyd, but it's from a different album. It's from Dark Side of the Moon, which came out close to the same time and is like the one of the top 10 best selling albums of all time. So it's still extremely well known. Um, it's more popular than The Wall and much more better known, much more well known than The Wall, but it's, it's a different album. But still, it's, it's on there. And the name of the album is Dark Side of the Moon comparing the side of the moon that's bright to the side of the moon that's dark, you know? So, even then there's like sort of a difference to it. I'll let it go at that, but I just want to throw all those things out there. It'd be very hard to think that this wasn't influential in any way. I mean, I can't argue either way. I mean, it's the fourth best selling Dark Side of the Moon is the fourth best selling album of all time. Again, I can't argue either way. I mean, I'll I'll let you have it. There's no way to prove it. 
no way to disprove it, at least in my on my end. I mean, you've done your research here, and I mean, it's best I, I, I can't fight any of this. I legitimately can't fight any of this, so it's like, you know, I give up. There's no point of even trying to argue with you on this. I mean, like, I don't know what influence, I mean, not, I guess, like, honestly, no one's gonna really come out with everything that influence, and they probably won't even know. They probably kidding and tell you everything that influenced them, so I mean, maybe this, <coughs> maybe this was somewhere deep recesses of his brain, he just kind of brought it, to, he kind of brought it subconsciously to, up to the forefront. Um, well, that being said, we're two minutes into the show. And... Yeah, you kind of like, uh, you kind of like rail, you kind of like, just almost kind of railroad it, you kind of just like, stop the train in the middle of the track and other trains are whizzing by the entire time wondering what was happening and I I, I was giving them signs that there's something going on here but there's something else I could do <laughs> but um to help speed this a little bit long so we're back on track well not back on track but um a little bit of information we get more backstory on Hawks and where his um where he comes from his background the whole idea that his father is a villain um all this kind of comes up comes comes up with his own little backstory to best genus who by the way we were both really confused about how in the world they convinced best genus was dead yeah, he was but he was brought back to life somehow i don't completely understand it Apparently he was some sort of separated. Went into it. Huh? It's some sort of ability that did it, right? I don't think so. That's why I was very confused. It looked, if from the way he described it, he before he it somehow turned Best Genesis' body into a no moon or something like that, and it, but it wasn't there was nothing in it, and he was acted as it, like he was supposed to be his real his real body. It was convincing enough that they convinced um, Davi. Davi and convinced Davi enough that Hawks was led into an inner circle. So that's pretty good. I, I'll watch it, but it, it, okay, so we, we learned that Hawks has got a lot of, it's got a particular set of skills. Um, we also learned a little bit more about how, um, it's interesting that uh, in the little beginning we see that apparently he saw All Might first, but he he kind of got influenced by Endeavor later because Endeavor inadvertently saved him from his father. Um, which is interesting. Uh, I don't think Endeavor will ever know that's what actually happened to Hawks, but uh, he, in he inadvertently saved him from his father, who I guess his father had some feather quirks, I'm guessing? I have no idea. I no. didn't see what the father's quirk was, if, it, if anything significant. I thought it was interesting that the mother... Well, I mean, uh, here... I'm looking at it at a uh, 329. Um, yeah. It looks like now, honestly, you could you could you can you could say this is a fashion statement on his on his uh on his his jacket, but in a world where I've never oh, seen this fashion statement, what is that? In a world where I've never seen tassels like this, I think that's his father's quirk. So if he was a combination of his two parents' his quirks then the floating eyeballs would be like his ability to move things around in the air and the feathers would come from his father. You know, I never thought of it, but apparently her, I think her eyeballs could see and detect everything, so that actually would make sense about how his feathers can do what yeah. they do. He can sort of see or something with them, can he? Uh, I, was I think it's he can tell. I guess he can observe. From, something yeah. about the wind and everything. His feathers are very special. Um, did you find it interesting that the mother was wearing jail stripes? Yeah, I, 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 mm, I didn't, I didn't know what to take, think of that. I was very confused in the entire statement. I, I was, as the scene was going on, I understood what was going on with Kago and uh, his father. His mother was the one thing that I was very confused by. Um, I felt bad for her, but at the same time, very confused. Uh, but at the same time, she saved her husband, who thought was very abusive. So. I, I I don't I don't know. I mean, Kagan was also very abused too. Sound like a weird distinction, but it was was he abusive or was he neglectful? To his wife? Um, yeah. I feel like he was like I feel like he was verbally abusive to her. Um, right. I didn't know if he was physically abusive to them, but they must. 
he definitely neglected them like didn't provide anything well based on his his wording he couldn't provide them apparently i mean not that that's any of their fault i'm just saying um, based on his wording he couldn't provide for them anyway right i'm not saying that that's their fault i'm just saying that based on what he was saying and how mean he was to his son um stuff mm-hmm. like that also how regardless of even how abusive he was to keiko keiko was very um disconnected from both of them actually more so his mm-hmm. father than his mother but he was still very disconnected almost like he had given up already um but i also want to say that it's kind of interesting that like i initially i thought maybe i just saw him kick Fox as a kid i thought he hit him but i wasn't sure but uh, <laughs> he kicked him out of the way so he's at least at least a little abusive I don't know if he like beat them, but kicking him out of the way is plenty for someone that you know was also capable. Well, based of. on the way they had to sneak around, because they find out later on that Hawks, you know, he had begged his mother to go outside, um, and his mother took him like any mother would because she wants her son to be happy. Uh, I don't know when that happened or if he ever found out about that, considering that Hawks are had already had a bruise on him to begin with. Good chance he already found out about that, but um. Alex's life was very scattered, disheveled. I mean, his father was was cruel. His mother was like distant at best. Um, even and I, I want to I, I don't want to say she didn't love him because a lot of things kind of contradict that. Um, the only thing that completely sells that is that you know she she tells her son why was he even born and stuff like that, but. That gets completely contradicted later on in terms of like the things that that this family does doesn't really make a lot of sense in terms of like what ultimately what they were doing the father on the other hand he was a douche um Mm -hmm. he he was a douche at the very beginning of the spectrum he he just he he was just cruel um but what i want to say actually specifically involving endeavor was besides endeavor saving him inadvertently from his father um, the only real reason it seemed like he even had that doll of Endeavor was specifically because his mother couldn't afford the All Might doll. So, mm-hmm. weirdly enough, he ended up getting the lesser of the two merchandises, but it got saved by the by the second of the hero when his best friend, and he became the number two hero when his best friend was twice, and he was a double agent. That was true. I mean, he led a very interesting life. I also want to point out, too, we also did finally get a chance to see how he got recruited for that special training program. Um, <laughs> that was weird. Uh, I guess it also... They also explained, too, how he was found out. He, he... There was a fire, and his father got upset about the fire and him leaving him leaving the house, you know, because he wasn't allowed to. I remember I was like, huh, I wonder, what's, I wonder what the connection between the fire and, and Hawks was. Later on, you find out apparently Hawks is trying to stop some bad guys and stop their car, and their car was set on fire. He did he did all that as a kid as he was running, I guess, trying to get back home or whatever. Because there's a scene of him running with the bag and his fling, his his uh, feathers being, you know, floating everywhere. I'm guessing that instance is what the NSA, I'm gonna call them NSA, found him. Anyway, because it seems kind of weird that you know if he wasn't allowed to use his his, his wings, and how would they have found him to begin with? Because I don't think I don't think his father would have put him into the National Court database, regardless of it being illegal or not. I mean, he didn't. To me, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that gets with the law, the villain and all. Um, but yeah, he, apparently his father gets put in jail, which is probably the nicest thing endeavors ever done for him, without knowing him. His mother just, I don't know, like his family life was not there. I guess is the best way to put it for Hawks. But we find out how he ended up where he was. His mother apparently ran ran off um, after giving information to uh, who, who assume, we're assuming is Dobby, um, about his real name and his connection to the villain, who I, I don't even know his, villain, his father's name. Um, she ran off saying that she couldn't be in that house anymore. His name's probably Drinks. Hmm? So it's Drinks. His name is Drinks and the Sun Hawks. 
His father's name is Drinks? Probably. If his name is Hawks, then that's probably Drinks. Because he's a drunk. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay, never mind. I thought I was about to say what the heck. <laughs> I you literally. Still- that went over my head. <laughs> you're like, gosh, is that really what it is? I mean, it'd be funny if that's what his name was, Drinks, but I don't know. Um. It's probably more like crappy instead of crappy. And it looks like a crappy, which is a type of fish. Also, I guess before we move on from Hawks, how badly do you think Hawks is beat up? Because he, he looked like that little that little casting he was wearing on his face, or that breathing mask. Looked like he was unable to breathe. He's even at, at the, uh, in, his, in his mother's house. He takes it off, you can hear him struggling to talk. Uh, I wonder like, how badly injured he was. Hawks or Hawks? You, you're talking about how badly injured Hawks was? Yeah. Yeah. Because his mask is on, he's like, that's helping him to breathe, but then he takes it off, and then you hear him struggling to breathe a little bit. I mean, he got the living hell out of him, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was pretty well. But I don't know. I don't know exactly to what extent. Now, probably the best genus talking to Hawks says that he um he undone the surgery that, that was done to him. The best genus said that he had undone the surgery? Yeah, apparently at that central hospital they were able to undo the surgery that was done to him, is what he says, is the words he uses. That's such a weird thing. I do think they're deliberately making it like Thanks to that, my body is ragged, like distressed denim. Do you think that they're deliberately making it difficult to understand what what he what happened to him? Honestly, like yes, problem. because I don't I don't think they'd know what happened to Best Genus. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's intentional, like that they are are trying to make it mysterious what happened to him, and they don't really know what they know. Like, oh. This seems kind of weird. I'm, I'm, I'm look at the episode. I'm look, looking at the wording he's using since they had someone hiding. Charles, it could have made. That's the surgery will be a success. I brought your fire to Davi in that state. His ver is that your identity verified? It was really, but it was really your body. So, in the past, you bought a problem. It is possible, and I mean, in the real world, it is possible to uh, appear dead. Uh, what? Oh. I mean, in, no, in, in, in the real world, it is possible to appear dead, but still be alive. But the yeah. the, the the amount of time that you can be in that state is very short, because this world's an exaggerated. Well, I mean, you can. Oh, it, it depends on what technology you have at your disposal. But but um, in this world, since, since reality and believability is stretched, I guess he could be in that state for a longer time than you would think. Um, I mean, maybe he just has really good genes. He waited to use that line. Um, <laughs> and he's oh, really proud of himself. And then, like, apparently, apparently, Dobby, without even knowing, preserved his body. So Hawks didn't even know that he was going to preserve his body. So a lot of things kind of happened. Um, kind of happened. I guess, like, it was good for Best Genius, but at the same time, it, um, it, I guess it wasn't something that was planned, at least from what I could tell. Like, I don't know how Hawks planned to get Dobby, I mean, get Best Genius' body back. But apparently Dobby, uh, Dobby pretty much wanted to preserve his body. I'm guessing that's what the whole Nomu talk was about. Like, they wanted to turn him into a Nomu. I guess it makes sense, turn the number three hero into a Nomu. Mm. I mean, that'd be unstoppable right there. Um... Well, we hope. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Genus is sort of a thinking hero, so if he, um, well, I mean, his like his fibers are really freaking strong. I mean, no, granted, no, granted, granted, he hasn't really been in the forefront of a lot of these bigger fights, so they're stronger than I thought they would be. Is what I'm gonna go with. <laughs> best Genus is a good hero because he. It'd be like if you took Eraserhead and made him a Nomu, like, now he's mindless and Eraserhead's strength is fine. Best Genus is powerful for sure, but, like, 
he's not like Endeavor. Like Endeavor could be mindless and he'd still be able to shoot huge fires and, and be a brute. But Genus, half of his ability that makes him good is his strategy and his creativity and stuff like that. He'd have to be an extremely high end one to like make that count. For him. I mean, I think they'd probably try to turn him into a high. I mean, if if the villains were trying to turn the heroes into new which I'm surprised they haven't tried. Besides the one that they did and successfully turned into Kuragiri, um, they would probably, in my opinion, they would probably, if All Might was still able to fight, they'd probably turn All Might into a high end. Pretty yeah. sure they'd turn Endeavor into a high end. It's gonna sound stupid, but they did turn villains into villains. All the all the Nomus were were said to be. Um, That's not what they were trying to turn heroes into Nomus. Hero. Oh, heroes! Yeah, I'm sorry. They were trying to turn heroes into Nomus, like. If All Might was still in his prime or whatever, still fighting, they could turn him into a no move. They turn Endeavor. So I'm pretty sure what would happen they turn All Might, Endeavor, and whoever was probably the third hero, number three hero, into a no move. They probably turned the third one to a regular no move, but they would probably turn the first two into high ends. Yeah. Okay, I could go with that. I think it's a stretch because I know they don't want to turn. Apparently, they don't turn heroes into Nomus, except for Kuragiri, who was Eraserhead and President Mike's best friend. Mm -hmm. So far, they only turned one hero into a Nomu that we know of. Um, You're talking about something I didn't remember. That's why I'm being quiet. I'm glad to hear it, but I just don't, I didn't remember that part. I mean, it was a, it was such a small, off-handed thing, and it was a, it was with with Racerhead and President Mike, and as the main characters of the episode that they were brought up in. I also want to point out too, it's like, hey, uh, Tox says that he's he's got stuff he's got to do, but it's kind of interesting that he's a, even though he's had the, the life he's had, he can still tell what, who's a good person. He kind of defends some of the villains, at least the League of Heroes specifically, uh, of their actions. He still says they're villains and they're bad and they need to pay for what they've done, but you know, they're fighting for what they believe is right, which is an interesting way to look at it. Um, like if the tables had been turned and these guys were the hit people we were fo um, following, we'd probably be rooting for every single one of them way more and, you know, Booby Guara or Twice, his death would have meant a whole heck of a lot more. Um, but because of a wicked twist of fate, we're not following all of them like that um, and they are the antagonists of the show. Uh, but is it? I guess it's interesting to say, like, you know, if the tables have been turned, they were the heroes, the good guys. Maybe we'd be rooting for them instead of who we're rooting for right now. That's completely fair. So it's kind of interesting like, how he how he worded it like that. He still says they're bad people, but it's like he had, he finds them relatable. Yeah, like he has, he, he has empathy for them. Which I gotta give Hawks credit for. I mean, it shows why he's a top hero and why he got there so young. At least his thought process, anyway. Um, yeah, it's really weird that they're really vague about what they did to Best Years. I hope they explain that. <laughs> I mean, not that they need to, because it was just a small bit of the story. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if they explained it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think people wouldn't mind if they explained it, but I don't think it would kill the story or momentum if they didn't. Um, no, I think it's okay to have like some mysteries in it. In a honestly, here's my story. thing. I'll let you continue. Uh, I'll, 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 say, I'll say all that after you finish. No, go for it. Here's my thing. If, if, I would like them to explain it, but here's the thing. It better not be dumb. And that's kind of the problem you kind of like, you, you have something that cool is the fact that it's such an interesting idea that you can rationalize in your brain like okay this world's very fictional and there's powers in this world there's probably some way they did it but it the way they explain it would probably yeah, ruin it it'd be like if you had a world where every place you went had a completely different culture and set of technologies and then you found like a talking motorcycle and you'd be like yeah i mean that could exist in a problem <sighs> really really I've been, I haven't thought about that show in a year. Even if we're right back. I'm just saying, you know. I don't think the talking bike is as That's bad right. of a thing as what they did here. I'm just saying. 
totally just be like, yeah, that's got to that probably exists. In the Anybody who freaking watches this can wonder what they're talking about. I was like, there's a there's a podcast in the past where I rant about something in a show. You can find okay. it. I'm not gonna go on my way to even remember where it was I spoke of it. But they have talked to robots in this show. They have a potion you can drink so you can read the thoughts of everyone around you for the rest of your life. They have worlds where like they're building tower the whole culture is to build a tower as high as it can and as soon as it falls back down everybody cheers and starts building it again. And they're excited that they got to see it fall in their lifetime. They have like a country that just for no good reason, like there's earthquakes and the country changes every single time. And that's why the map isn't right that he's the per char- main character is using. The character has a machine gun, but there's some places and there's dolls that like seem to have few thoughts and feelings and all of these things. And he's mad that there's a talking motorcycle. Moving on. Um. But from here, we, we, uh, let's get close to the end of the episode. Um, we're still not there yet, but what? He's like, yeah, bro, but what about the talking motorcycle? Have we thought about the, we haven't put enough time into the talking motorcycle, and that's basically with, like, the whole podcast. I'm not, I'm very close to that door. It's locked behind two padlocks. I'm not opening that door again. No matter how much you want me to, because it's hilarious. Um... We move on to the rest of the world, uh, world building kind of interesting way to segue. Uh, <laughs> um, the world right now is I thought it would be, and I, I remember it being very, uh, wasn't shocked by how the world was reacting. Now some of the things that have happened, um, such as some of the heroes leaving, some of the older heroes retiring like that uh, samurai dude, um, he just straight up said I give up and just, you know, he retired. So there's like a lot of older heroes who are like in their 60s or whatever, who are retiring or 80s, who knows. Um, like the world just kind of like turned upside down and then the civilians are taking it upon themselves by taking support items and yeah. getting up the bad guys. Like the world is really messed up and it's like, um, I don't know what you call that, but there's actually a word for like civilians taking action for themselves. Um, Mob justice. I guess mom, I think there's another word, but I guess mom justice is the best way to put it. Like, you know, they're all, the shop owners are saying we're not taking him more. We're going to take out these people um, ourselves. We're not going to wait for the heroes. And it's kind of funny that um, one of the instances of a hero getting to a place late, they use the washer hero. I thought that was kind of funny because I'm sitting like, who are the heck have you been this entire show? You popped up a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and the one time you pop up, you're getting you're you're getting berated. <laughs> like, I, get angry. I get angry when I'm saying, "I'm like, what do you even do?" <laughs> well, I mean, that's what they said. <laughs> like, like, bubbles, and he's gonna really fly out. And that's all we know. I mean, the bubbles can heal though, based on one of his t- his attacks, they can heal. Well, I mean, there's oh, that. Okay. <laughs> um, again, they had to stretch the the believability of his power, apparently. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the, it, apparently the Nomus did a lot of damage to the things. The heroes just can't keep, like, the, the hole that was, like, that was ripped open from season one. I like that they even bring up the whole Nomu from the first attack. <laughs> you keep saying the it's hole. like, huh? You keep saying the hole. Sorry, it's just that there's a rip in the fabric of the universe right now in the world, and, you know, it's it's, it's getting wider. The heroes keep on taking hits, mm-hmm. which makes sense. I mean, they can't keep showing the civilians that they, they can protect them. The villains are out here. Lots of villains are killing people. Hmm? There's hardly civilians left, though. I mean, there's still lots of villains from this way. I mean, some of them, uh, like you see in, in uh, seven fifty three or so, Best Genius is driving really fast down the road. It's like a three lane street in the middle of a city. There's not one car or person in the entire area until he hits the weapon guy. I mean, they're probably hiding somewhere. People are afraid for their lives, literally. There's not a single person anywhere at all. He's just... Hey, by the way, who do you think is supplying these civilians with these support items? Uh, support hero? But then they bring up, like, um... The, uh... What's his name? The guy with the um, with the quirk that he, he the more angry he gets, well not angry, 
kind of the same thing. But like, aggravated he gets, the, um, the bigger he gets or the stronger he gets, and he, he's kind of like the Incredible Hulk, but he's not. It's not Despero, is it? Destro. No, Des Destro. Destro. Um, Destro Jr. I, I, they bring up that, like, um, he said the seeds have been sown, and it's an interesting little thing that they brought up here that maybe it's his company. I think his name is the company is Destronet or something like that, and they're support they're selling support items. I remember seeing what? that scene. What? The same person was low key sending out those um, those injections that made you overpowerful at one point too. I don't think he Mark was responsible for that. I think that was uh, that was um, overhaul. Oh, okay. I was just curious because I remember they just kind of float that idea in one of the episodes. They're like, oh yeah, what if they were like doing this and then like nobody kind of like, I mean there's a chance of, that like he could do it too that company could do it too there's no there's nothing there's nothing saying they can't it was just sort of forgotten like as time went on it was just like everybody kind of forgot that was a thing yeah but, when they'll use it I mean it's one of those things that they have in the back and you know they can pop that back up anytime you want you but like, oh yeah you can do that oh snap they can do that type of, type of situation yeah but I wonder if they were the same people distributing the uh, support items now, because there was a lot of like unclearness about what was going on there to me at one point. I mean, I, it could be. I mean, I guess the, the thing is like maybe they've managed to get their foothold in the world now, because now humans are like civilians. No people are like, I can't trust the heroes, you know, to, to do their job. Um, the first thing you see a support item is when um, best genius is on the scene and he's like saving somebody there was like a mumble in there that like we don't need you and then you look and they're like he looks over at him and the guy has like a metallic arm and i'm pretty sure that was like the first support item hint right there i mean yeah we saw the first i think that was the first first support item we saw it just it was very interesting that the civilians are taking their like i mean, I mean at the same time as like i can't blame them because like the heroes are one by one either leaving are, you know, there's not enough of them. Um, there's a scene where you have Stain. Like, it's even after the whole I am not here statue. I'm surprised that's still up. You'd think they would have knocked that over. <laughs> Honestly, maybe actually. It was, maybe it was popular. Hmm? Maybe it was sort of popular. I guess, I just uh, <laughs> concerned that I know they don't like All Might anymore. Yeah, like maybe people found it relatable. Is what I mean. Yeah, that's true. I just, I just kind of, it was just kind of funny that you had this gold bron or bronze statue of All Might with fist in the air. Now they have that. I am not here. And like, okay, well, they all blame All Might for some of this. Um, do you have this scene where you see uh, Stain? I almost called him Deathstroke. Uh, yeah, Stain uh, so, in some like abandoned building. He managed to find his sword. Uh, Stain's gonna pop back up. Also, Stain looks like he's like, I'm ready to take some heads. Like, like, it's like it's really creepy. creepy. It's like he's he's ready to go back on the on the hunt again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got his sword back. The sword is rusty, which is kind of a cool metaphor too. Well, his sword is always yeah. rusty. I don't think his sword was ever sharp when he first died. If I remember correctly, I think his blades were just messed up from the get-go because of how many people he's cut. I think you can get Lockjaw if he cut you. Ugh. Well, I mean, it's better than that guy who actually locks you just by touching his hand to you. <laughs> um, then from there, we just, we go to, like, the hospital again, and we see a broken down Endeavor, both in body and in spirit, uh, but everything that's happened. Uh, we see, we see the first hint of real remorse we've seen in his eyes the entire show, and, um, I want to say that this is the weirdest scene, um, him crying, it was, I was shocked at how much he was crying. I can't believe how much water he was producing for a guy who has a flame cork. <laughs> oh, you softy, what a cute line. Uh, dang it, but, um, that was interesting how he, he, essentially he gave up, he says he can't fight his son, like, he's apologizing to, about everything, he's like, how he, he couldn't do anything when his first son was kidnapped or in danger, 
didn't do anything with his own his 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 like youngest son was in danger. He, like I mean, it was interesting to see this kind of helplessness in Endeavor's face for the first time because normally it's all about I gotta do better, I gotta be better than that person, I gotta be better than all my it seems like he's totally given up. Um so much so that he ends up crying and then his son walks in on him and shuts the door on him again. <laughs> He wasn't yeah, expecting. Yeah. He wasn't expecting yeah. it, and he just yelled, "Show talk," <laughs> which has become a meme. Apparently, the show he just shouts his son's name for no reason. Um, it's because nobody cares about him, huh? And it's because nobody cares about him. He's a dumb character. Everybody sees him sad, and they're like, "What a win! What a jerk!" But he's like regretting everything he's done in the past, and it's all come to hurt him. I mean, like he said, he, he knew it was gonna happen, but he wasn't expecting it to like happen yeah, all at that, once. Try that on like a post like that on Reddit. Like, am I the asshole for like beating my wife? See what he's, the say. Speaking of his wife, <laughs> um, the first the episode ends with they family together and the mother who's got the serious, the most serious face I have ever seen. I don't think we've ever seen her eyes. Other than that one scene where she's terrified for whatever reason. Um, you've never seen her eyes past that, and I thought it was really interesting that she walks in saying that we gotta talk about our family. Uh, so it looks like it's gonna be her talking in the next episode. I didn't see the preview, so I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. But um, I kinda wanna prevent myself from seeing the preview because I kinda wanna see everything happen firsthand. But, uh,. Yeah, there's a scene with Endeavor, you know, just like, he's he's broken, he's beaten. And Shoto just walks in on him and closes the door again because he wasn't prepared to see his father crying. I never, he never seen my papi cry like that. As you can hear, Spirit does not care. <laughs> I feel very, very sad about this. Like, he's just gonna, he, like, and he's just gonna, like, this entire thing, he's probably not even gonna care about what's happening. Well, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel bad for this guy because I mean, yeah, he's made some poor decisions, but I don't think he deserves to be ca called a bad guy for his life. Like... Yeah, but you you don't care about Yorori Musha falling on his own sword. Was he was that a metaphor? Is he literally gonna go and fall on his sword and kill himself? You didn't care about that. Who? Number nine hero who retires in shame and says he's gonna fall on his own sword, and then he's up there and he looks so stripped down because he's his name is equipped hero, like he is Yori Musha, the equipped hero. He has no equipment on. He walks up, he talks to them, and he says, now is the time for me to fall on my own sword. And everybody's like, boo, boo. And he walks off, and he want me to give a crap about Endeavor, like, having little tears. For being but has, tears. like, has that guy done anything? <laughs> I don't think I've seen him do one see. thing or since he's been introduced. Uh, hero. What? And meanwhile, Game Hunter's over here all, like, what have you done for me lately? Sure, you're the number nine hero, but what have you done for me lately? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, and then the next sentence, he's like, they don't use wash enough in this anime. <laughs> As you can hear, he's having a lot of fun over there. Um, I unfortunately cannot and will not stop him. Uh, yeah, the next episode's gonna be, I guess, about like the backstory of what's happening, what's really what going on with the Todoroki oh. family. I hadn't seen it. I don't want to hear it. I'm gonna wait till, till Saturday to watch it. Um, I am going to be waiting to see what, what's going on in their background, what happened, what led to this, whatever this mess is, and I will make my judgment at that point. So let's, let's talk about a couple things. Um, it's been hard for me to get a word in edgewise, and I've been trying not to be too aggressive about it because um, I talked for like the first half hour, like nonstop. But... Are we just not going to mention that um, Endeavor's doctor was literally Toad from Mario? I mean, I, I was trying to fit that in there, but at the same time, I couldn't. So literally, Toad. there's like no no ambiguity about it whatsoever. It's Toad. Well, I mean, he's a mushroom. He's a doctor. I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, just like, I don't, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, no, I thought that was really weird. I mean, they do it so dryly, too. He's just kind of chilling. 
He's a doctor though, and they missed the mushroom. Mushrooms are, are, are uh, I almost called it an aphrodisiac. That's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> oh. Hello, nurse. <laughs> um, I think it's nice that we had that moment where Endeavor is like beat up and he's looking out the window and everybody hates him. And he's crying because now Endeavor knows what it's like to have the crap eaten out of himself by a family member. Here we go. The floor gets a bit opened. <laughs> um, and then we have... I want to apologize to all Endeavor fans before I let them continue. Just want to no, apologize. I'm just I was just pointing that out about Endeavor. Like, he's sitting there and he's crying, but like, it's kind of cool that he finds like, the justice of the show to give him a taste of his own medicine. Like, that, that was great. You know, I was like, oh, yeah. It's like a it's like a moral story now. Like he, he knows I mean he's not life. he's not crying because he got beat. He's crying that he couldn't he, save his son. Yeah, he's crying because he didn't get his way. Um He's crying because he's frustrated that he can't have everything. So that being said, um the uh they have a scene. I'm going back to Hawks now, where he was a, as a kid and he was attacking the bat. It, was, it looked like he was attacking bad guys to me at first, and then I realized that he wasn't stealing food, but he was probably saving people as a kid. Um, but when they show that scene around 1349-ish, where um, red feathers are falling from the sky, it made me wonder, because it reminded me of the scene in Red Garden, where there's... Um, there's a few scenes like this where I've seen red things showering from the sky. In Red Garden, it's butterflies. Um, there's red butterfly imagery throughout the whole thing. And then in Kino's journey, there's a couple, there's a scene where Kino throws herself into the sea of poppies, red flowers, and flower petals fly up in the air. And I feel like I've seen that in other animes too. And it was interesting to me because I was curious if like, you know how I identified the train as being like a spiritual thing in, uh, in the last anime we saw? I was wondering, I'm saying putting it that way because people that are new in the podcast won't know that we just came out of Shaman King. But um, I was wondering if there was a connection here to like some sort of bigger motif where they have red items sprinkling from the sky. I looked into it a little bit, and I didn't find specifically something on red feathers falling from the sky meaning anything, but I found out that there's a lot of significance to red feathers um, in, in particular. They, um, the Japanese see the red feathers as a symbol of courage and valor, and also they're connected to autumn, which I thought was sort of interesting. Um, but red feathers like are something that are, are passed around because of that, like because they have significance as a symbol of courage and valor. And I thought that was interesting when you compare it to um, what was going on there. But I also found from another source that um, red feathers are often this is now this is in Japanese culture. Red feathers are often given someone that's faced adversity or hardship in their lives as a reminder that they have the strength inside them. I thought that was pretty interesting. And it represents the ability to continue despite any challenges that might be in your way as a sign of strength and power. So the fact that they have those red feathers falling, I think would have hit a Japanese viewer that like those red feathers, like just like if we see a rose, we think love. I think they saw the red feathers as that deep symbolism that like someone that's faced adversity and hardship that they have the strength inside of them and their ability to continue despite any challenges might be in their way probably was hitting a Japanese audience more likely than it would for an American audience because that's not the real but I still appreciated that that was sort of like floated there I'm sorry what do you think about that? I'm gonna uh disagree with me? no I uh I had a thought and then like it kind of flew in my mind when you kind of called me out. But I was like going through your notes to see if I see anything. Um, there's a few things I want to point out actually. Um, I don't really got anything to say towards what you said. I just gonna say I guess I agree. <laughs> Whoa, are you kidding me? But um, 
A few things, actually. There's um, this interesting thing you say here in your notes at like 753 about Best Venus' car. I think this is interesting because somebody in the comments of the episode of My Hero Academia on Crunchyroll uh -huh. says that exact thing. It looks like That's it's the Batmobile to them. It looks like a portmanteau of two specific Batmobiles. Yeah, yeah here. Um, Jager is 93, 1993, three days ago, says, so apparently the best genius drives the Batmobile. Literally says exactly what you just said. I literally didn't even think about that, and then I, I read, I, I remember reading that, and I saw your, I saw your quote, and I'm like, huh. So I guess he wasn't the only one who saw the Batmobile. But it's a combination of two specific Batmobiles, and I'm putting them in the chat for you, the pictures. One of the one of the common Batmobile models is it's got some sort of rocket thing in the front, which has been represented by a lot of different things like a grappling hook and stuff like that. And I don't know what its official thing is, but it's it's got like two points and some sort of rocket in the middle. But the other thing that it looks like is the more the other traditional Batman Batmobile, which is really boxy looking, like in the second picture I showed you. So you have that boxy one, but you also have the two prongs like that. It's almost like they took the two most popular images of the Batmobile and just kind of like merged them into one. So that it wasn't exactly like stealing because there's like it's more like a creative like interpretation of the two, but it's still definitely the two. Matt, I can see you talking about it at the same time. He only ever has to come out saying that he's a fan of Marvel. I don't think there's even a car like that in Marvel. Again, the Batmobile is pretty. I mean, you don't have to be a fan of DC to know who Superman and Batman are. I think it's fair point. Um. So then I was thinking about Genus himself because his look has always sat with me, and I've never been one hundred percent clear on why. And I had told you last time that it was like kind of a samurai look or a ninja look, but I'm I'm gonna backpedal on that. I'm gonna say that he might have been inspired. And this is going to strike you as really weird, but like, remember how Japanese sort of like takes an American thing and sort of makes it their own and sort of a misunderstood, like, let me put it this way. Have you ever had a dream and it was a dream that you're really interested in? So you try to go to sleep and like continue the dream, but what you get afterwards is sort of like a twisted, warped version of the dream. It's not the whole real dream. It's like a parallel dimension kind of mutation of the dream. Have you ever done that? No, I've never done that. I, I barely can remember the dreams. Sometimes I even have, so I don't even attempt to go back into it. Some of the Sometimes dreams I end up, I die in. So like, yeah, just take that with a grain of salt. That would be a cool dream to see, then you'd know what happens after you die. Um, so anyway, the, like, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> dream never died in, those are the ones I'd want to hear about. So the, um, what I was thinking about here is what it really reminds me of. And if you look at my notes, see that picture of that DC character, Vigilante? Mm -hmm. That picture is very common in cowboy and Indian movies, which is why they drew it on him, where they take a bandana and they wrap it around their face, really to that extent, extent where their, their eyes are just like the only part peeking out. And another thing that's really iconic Two other things that are really iconic to a cowboy character are wearing blue jeans and um, and having their uh, lasso. And Best Genist has his jeans all the way up to his nose, but it sort of looks like, it ends up sort of looking like the scarf idea. And, um, and he doesn't use a lasso, but he, sh he uses fibers and wraps people up in fibers, which is sort of not entirely separate from the idea of a lasso. I mean, if you started with that general idea and then you worked on it a lot and like developed the idea, eventually the idea would get away from its origins. But it felt like this was sort of uh, something that started with somebody thinking about cowboys and then just sort of went off and got its own life. He even has a Texas-style belt buckle. If you notice, there's like a buckle around his face. But if you look farther down on his body, he has a second belt on. And there's like a belt buckle there that's kind of big and Texas-looking. Like a little bit bigger than it, like a typical belt buckle and like more like in the style of someone from Texas. You know, I, uh, 
as you were getting up to that point, my brain had already put the two and two together. <laughs> you were thinking that it was a cowboy already, because that's pretty. pretty no, I was reading. I was reading that, and then as you were talking, my brain started putting what you're about to put onto the table all together. <laughs> Yeah. I literally so, got to the lasso thing before you even said it. <laughs> I thought it was sort of interesting. I just, like, I was getting a kick out of, like, looking at that because he's really, it's been, like, a little, like, worm in my brain, like, trying to figure out what he reminded me of. And, like I said, I was falling on Ninja just because Ninjas do that thing with the mask, but it looks more like that. It looks like maybe there's, like, I bet somewhere in some really popular Cowboys and Indians movie, there was some popular scene where the guy's hat blows off. You know, of course, a cowboy might have blonde hair, and blonde hair would be more iconic of someone pulling an American thing than a Japanese thing, because Japanese people don't have blonde hair unless they dye it. So, um, you know, or they're not, or they're born in Japan but not like you know originally. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. I'm like, this is actually sort of like a twisted par like derivative of a cowboy character. Didn't think he was a cowboy, but now you said that, I guess it kind of makes sense. So I always wonder, is... It's also makes sense, too, why he would be number four and then move up to number three. Because Cowboys and Indians movies did kind of start on a lower, on a lower like, somebody, you know, things that people like, but they're not, like, up there, but then they move to being something that's really popular. Then yeah. Best, best Junis' that's case, like, it kind of makes yeah. sense. I get a sense that Cowboys are popular in Japan because we... We have a lot of popular animes like um, Outlaw Star, you know what I mean? Has that sort of cowboy feel, Cowboy Bebop, where it says CU Space Cowboy at the end of every episode. Trigun's definitely got a Western motif. Um, there's a lot of popular animes out there that do have that sort of cowboy feel. So it makes sense to me that like this person might be a fan of cowboys in one way or the other. We do have to move on to another show, but uh, I, I do want to, I guess, I guess, poke out a few other things on your list here. Because um, you asked a question, and I happen to see this here, and I didn't notice this here, and I wish I had answered it as I was talking. Uh, okay. But um, did Dobby have white hair as a kid somehow? Um, they mention, well, not they, he mentions, well, in his life, like, you see that his hair does turn white oh, as really? he gets older. You okay. see it actively happen. Okay, so I wasn't just making that up. I was worried that I was like, later when I looked at that, I'm like, no, of course not. It's the older brother. But. We also see Dobby know. remove the hair color too, so he shows that his hair is white. Okay. But this, this stuff does happen. You know, Dobby's hair is actually white. He just has he just has hair color. He just has hair dye in his hair. I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, it wasn't like my most important question of all, but. I do, before we get out of this, I do want to talk about the flower that Ray brings you, because I did about half an hour of research on that. No, 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 not, I couldn't see all this, these bulleted points down here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the flower that Ray brought in, I thought, I, I locked into it, because you know how I am with symbolism. And it was a single, it had a single stem, but it had two blue flowers, kind of, or purple, depending on how people defined it as coming off of it. I mean, some people call it, there are no blue flowers, there's only purple that are really light. But I mean, some flowers are straight up blue, like magical flowers. That being said, um, there was once one stem, I put step here, but I meant stem, and two blue flowers, which to me felt like a union, like a marriage. You know, there's your two, but you're locked in together as one as well. Um, and a flower being, you know, a sign of beauty and production, you know what I mean, reproduction. Um, it was a nice metaphor for a flower, but I was like, I think there's more to this because they not only do they show it um, at the end of the episode, but they show it in the preview for the next episode too. So tiny, almost irrelevant spoiler, but I guess I saw in a tweet that the flower was Dobby's flower, and that's all I know, so I feel like it's not so much of a spoiler that I'd avoid saying it. So I guess it also sort of represents that. Um, but there was like, I found, as I continue to research this, I found all these interesting facts about the flower. It symbolized victory, accuracy, justice, someone loving someone who is full of sorrow. And if that doesn't fit Endeavor, I don't know what does. It also fits Dobby. 
you know, is loving someone that's full of sorrow. Lonely love and chastity, which is definitely something that defines their marriage because like neither of them are together or doing anything with themselves or anybody else. Um, the victory and justice thing definitely fits Endeavor as well. And ironically fits Dobby. And then the Japanese, it's a rind, rindu or rindau. I don't know what the pronunciation is because I didn't hear it. I just read it, R-A-N-D-O-U, or the autumn bellflower. And another autumn, um, another autumn symbolism. And I think I was, I don't know if I mentioned it, but in the wall, um, the character's tumbling through the sky in one scene, he turns into a fall leaf and then tumbles and turns back into the, the uh, little puppet character. Um, so there's like three different points here where I found autumn symbolism all together as well. But the Japanese name for this um, this flower literally tra translates to dragon innards, which represents the, pretty much the whole family, uh, it's at least on Endeavor's side. Um, so I thought that was extremely interesting. And uh, her bringing it to him in this scenario is really interesting because the flower, um, the myth that was connected to this, I guess, was that like, somebody was walking along and saw a to toad licking a flower. <laughs> and they're like, Toad, why are you licking the flower? And he's like, because I feel sick. And uh, and then they take the flower home and, it, and lo and behold, it cures illnesses. The, one of the main illnesses of the clears is inflammation of the stomach, but I thought that was sort of interesting too, that it um, as you, calms you. What? As you continue, this sounds arbitrarily Japanese, just wanted to support this out. <laughs> Oh, yeah. This is the entire, yeah. the entire thing. But continue. Think about the layer even for that. Like, Endeavor's literally burning up inside at this moment. And it's supposed to... It's supposed to calm an upset inside. It's calming. It, it stops inflammation. You know, flame. And she's brought it to him. So there's, like, so many different layers of meaning to that and i thought it was a super cool thing to like be able to dive into that and find all these different layers and an anime that's not always that like oh, i'm sorry it wasn't a toad it was a rabbit um it had dug up the rabbit the roots of it that it found in the snow and somebody asked why they were doing it the rabbit said my husband is sick so i came looking for rindo and then he found it off and then they brought it back and found out it, was, it wasn't a toad it was a rabbit eating them um Still, arbitrarily yeah. Japanese. <laughs> yeah. So there's that, and then there, if you want to reverse it, there's the symbolism of the two of them trying to combine together to make something greater than them, like not just in marriage, but in offspring. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then the other thing that's weird is that like another possible meaning for the name of the, um, the flower, because it's it also means victory um, in flower language, but like it's... One possible meaning for that is a spiritual herb that can triumph over in illness. The other possible meaning is how it blooms straight up, as if it's confident in the event its eventual triumph over disease. But the idea of blooming straight up is definitely not what's going on here. So there was like sort of like if you reverse the symbolism, there's there's irony there too. You know that it, they didn't go, the bloom didn't go straight up. It went side to side and all over the place and well, the marriage of two didn't become one thing that was stronger it's sort of like one thing not strong i want to say that maybe um maybe it will bloom straight up maybe uh there is some victory here where um for the longest time like endeavor could never face his wife but for the first time it, for some unknown reason she's oh, coming yeah. to him there's but some this, sort of victory there. It's like, okay, she's willing to see him, but he's unwilling to see her, for whatever reason that is. The moment of victory, in other words, right? Yeah, like the moment, of, like the moment of victory. Like she came to him, so whatever it was that was keeping them these two apart is not there anymore, or it's broken by this point. Because, yeah. like, I mean, up to this point, she has seen everything that's happened to Endeavor, and as from what I could tell, this there was really no hatred that I could tell mm -hmm. from them in this current timeline so like and she was aware that he was bringing her flowers anyway and she seemed like she was happy that he was doing that anyway but yeah but it's kind of funny that she came to see him and brought those flowers like you said <laughs> with her mm -hmm. but it's kind of interesting too it's like you know he will go to see her but never walk into her room she comes to see him one time and walks straight into his room 
it's a it's a power move for sure. <laughs> um, so I thought the only other thing that I I I'm not saying everything single thing for my notes, but I don't want to skip mentioning that it's interesting that we explored Hawks's past, and it's consistent with the plot line so far because it shows that you don't have to be. Um, Troubled past doesn't have to make you a bad person, you know, as we've seen with Shigaraki's core story and some of the things they've said about Spinner and Twice and stuff like that, where they all kind of cite their past as the reason that they became evil, like having a past that was unsatisfying or difficult or painful in some way. But here we have Hawks that has was raised by a criminal, had like a sort of a messed up mom, you know what I mean, that wanted him to go steal to, to provide for the family all these different challenging like frustrating experiences but he was the number two hero and he kind of remained pure so there was this like little note of hey it doesn't have to be that way um that i kind of enjoyed about this episode that hawks kind of is like thrown in the face of actually a lot of the other things that are going on hey you said that's actually kind of a little bit more of another victory for endeavor too um, Endeavor wanted to change a lot of what he was doing after everything happened with his son during season two, but and but also it kind of seemed like to me that maybe he thought that everything he did was bad, which I mean yeah most of those things he did was bad, but um he actually did one thing that was kind of a victory too, he influenced Hawks. Hawks spent a lot of time he actually says this too as a kid that he spent a lot of time thinking heroes weren't real, but when his father was taken away by the police. And it was by Endeavor he realized that heroes are real. He spent a good time. He's he spent a good deal of his job thinking they were they were just myths, which is yeah. interesting in a world where powers are a thing. But um, it's interesting that Hawks kind of got saved, kind of by a man at the time who wasn't really trying to save anybody other than become stronger than All Might. So in, in a really interesting way, like not everything that Endeavor did was bad. It had a they had effects, and apparently one of the effects was inspiring somebody to become a hero. Yeah, that is cool. So in a really weird way, and I guess it's another thing too. Is like it's kind of sad that Endeavor will never know this unless Hawks comes out and tells him. But um, maybe that would be an interesting little thing that they have that will end Endeavor's like little you know a redemption thing is that uh, the one hero that he found annoying was the one hero he inspired. Yeah, I mean it'd be. So like, He's still a shit sandwich. He's just not a soggy one. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Sorry, oh. just that I like. <laughs> I was trying to have a good moment with him here, and then he decides to just like, no, I'm not letting this happen. I'm not letting this stand. <laughs> I will not let this be the one thing that is left here with this show. I just don't want to be part of a podcast that like endorses like wife beaters. Okay, moving on to uh, Dragon Prince. Um, I'm gonna let my co-host here take away here, um, and I will chime in when it's necessary. <laughs> okay, so we're on episode seven. Yes. Of the Arabos series. So at the beginning of this, um, they're heading through the three zones, like these three sort of you expect this to be some sort of like trials, because trials very often come in sets of three. So you at the beginning of this I felt like very um intimidated by this because I was like, this is it. You know, we're you know what I mean? We're gonna be going through three Herculean trials, like, you know, like we see in myths and things like that. But it was sort of like the trials are more pleasant than anything in a lot of ways. You know, like the first one, I mean, yes, they're difficult. Like, it's definitely a security system. But in the first one, they, um, the fan sort of just in passing says, well, they've lost sacrifice of some sort, and they have no idea what he's talking about, but then they, like, they're like, oh, but look, that's shiny. And they walk to an to a entire labyrinth full of shiny things, and they forget that he mentioned the blood sacrifice or whatever the hell he was talking about and go on with it. Okay. Um, that being said, um, the first trial was more like a boy. Like they walk in and there's like shimmering crystals everywhere, and 
Talon even picks up a moon crystal in the process that is super magical and like will help him later. Um, they find a dead knight laying in the corner and they get about that. But there's no like, there's no real clear indicator of like what could have that in the series, which is sort of a confusing point for me. I don't know if they were trying to like foreshadow like um, some sort of treachery that was coming up on them. You know what I mean? Because we know that treachery is on the way. But it was sort of a weird thing to do where they just like find the dead knight and they're a little bit worried about it, but like they don't. Nothing in that cavern that I came across could have killed them. Um, well, I mean, up to up to this point, you know, people were going up to the dragon and offering gifts, sacrifice. Something again that they in, kind of gloss over on purpose. Um, in this cavern, there's nothing I noticed that like would do something like that. It's just a, it's a crystal cavern, and that seems to be pretty much it. So I wasn't clear on what in this specific cavern would have made someone leave for death. Um, yeah, that's that's what I was saying. I don't know if like they were like I said. I don't know if it was a writer's trick to set the tone for treachery here and remind you while you're looking at all these beautiful crystals and magical items and glowing things and playing a, a beautiful song out of them and things like that. I don't know if they did that and they were thinking that like. We better remind them that there's like a little bit of foreboding involved in this too, and just put a dead guy in here. Well, I mean, and, according to I think what I understand about that is that you need to you need to tap those crystals, but there's no way to know unless you are aware of the whatever crystal you're, you need to tap onto. I think the whole idea is you're gonna get lost in there because it's a labyrinth, and you could start to death. That's fair, but I mean, it didn't look like they were walking through a labyrinth. It looked like they were sort of just mostly walking in a straight line, so I, I didn't get that labyrinth feel from it, but that's not that it wasn't one, it just well, didn't... I didn't see it animated very well. If it was I don't labyrinth. think you could animate something like that, too well, unless it's like darkness, and then you have crystals like lighting a path, but they do that later with the darkness and the path. But... Yeah. But then in that place, well, this one's all about light, and the next one's all about darkness. So then you cut back to Claudia, and she meets... Soren, and in classic Claudia is oblivious to what a demon she is. She's like, oh, why are you wearing pictures? And uh, the audience just kind of groans and says, that's my Claudia! Wah, wah. I want to point uh, out that uh, as Claudia and Sword like, meet and Soren's like, you're on the wrong side. She literally says, I knew you would, you would do this. And then as as Soren is about to grab her, somehow pulls off a ninja move, crawls up the tree, jumps out and grabs the wings of the bat and starts flying off. It's like she's way more nimble than I thought she would be. Just saying. I'm also not clear on if she was really in any danger, if she could have gotten herself out of any moment that she knew people were down. And she wanted to buy time until everybody else got there. I mean, because she's it's possible that maybe she thought that if she was she was going to get away, she better do it now because she might... Family. T typically, you're vulnerable to family. So, uh, I know it's a stretch, but at the same time, it's like... Eh. I mean, I, I, that's the best I can come up with. Like, maybe she be she let her guard I, down enough around Sora and that Sora could capture her. Which kind of happens. I actually think it's a stretch. I just don't think she was worried at any point. Like, she didn't look like a, someone that was actually trapped. She looked like someone that was... I don't know, biding their time, you know, waiting for something to happen. So it was just unclear to me if she was actually worried about anything or if she was just kind of like doing her thing. I think she just wasn't, she, was, she wasn't expecting to come across Soren and she kind of panicked, quote unquote. No, I, I, let me, let me rephrase that. I think that he tied her up on his own steam. I think he legitimately tied her up. What I doubt is that she couldn't get away. Are you talking about when they first encounter? Are you talking about after he fell on her to save her from the fall and he tied her up? Is that what you're talking about? Like him being him being afraid when, of Claudia? Or Claudia being afraid of him? When he tied Claudia up and then she, like, when he cap captures her and ties her up, uh -huh. I think he captured her and tied her up on his own, um, on his own uh, virtue. I think that that was something he earned. He captured her, 
he chased after her. He got squeaky and said yip yip, which is just a thousand percent Avatar reference to Appa. And he was like, "You're trying to get you don't let them know to... that." <laughs> he was trying to start talk the, the thing into flying. He's like, "Come on, up, away, let's go, yip yip." And he says yip yip, and the thing like leaps into the sky. Um, and a winged Claudia, like chases the winged Claudia, and he captures her. And I think like she didn't expect him to be so tough. He hunts her down. He like chases her down, gets her down, captures her, ties her up. I think up to that point, he did what he was trying to do, despite Claudia trying as hard as she could, without killing him to avoid it. When she wakes up and she's tied up, I think at that point, she probably could have gotten herself out of that situation. Oh yeah, I mean, I, uh, you talk, oh, that's what you're talking about. It's like you didn't think she was in any real danger and that she got captured. Okay, that was very confusing what you're talking about. No, yeah, I agree. No, she was waiting for um, Varen and her boyfriend to catch up. I think she was waiting for Varen and her boyfriend to catch up, and if she really needed to, she would have gotten out of that trap, either by tricking him because she's so much smarter, or in evil, or by using some sort of magic trick. No, I a thousand percent agree. I a thousand percent. I don't think she was in any danger there. She, she could have gotten out. Yeah, I think for her it was just more convenient to wait until everybody showed up. Well, she shut up, so I mean, she wasn't she she wasn't she wasn't uh, gonna communicate with him. That's another thing I brought up last time we talked about Dragon Prince. I find it kind of aggravating that um, this show kind of I mean, this show does a really good job with this, but I find it aggravating with these characters. Communication, the lack of communication is so bad here. <laughs> really? Why? What? Why? Like. It's just like she's not willing. Like no one's telling everybody what's going on. Uh, Claudia thinks she's on the good side because she's like trying to save her father. Soren at this point does not know this information. Uh, I feel like things would have probably played out much differently if she had literally said something about that. Soren didn't do a good job saying exactly why she was on the wrong side. All she says is that you're trying to bring back an evil monster into the world. She doesn't know the information that he knows. He she doesn't know that he doesn't know the information she knows. You got like over the elves, for instance, doing all sneaky things around humans because, like, you know, the human, like, the communication was was so f- not there with those two groups because, like, one's trying to protect the village from being burnt down, the other one's trying to do a supernatural, supernatural, trying to do something spiritual for their family because that's something that they want to do. Things mm-hmm. just like the, the 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 things that are happening probably could have been avoided if, if, if there was at least a little bit of like hey this is what you don't know that i know type of talk which is the point of everything that's happening right now but it's just like it's just doing a good job of showing that like the lack of communication is really the biggest downfall of any if anything no one's talking to each other they're assuming and that's of all they're doing yeah i completely agree it really shows here. It's like if they just could talk, probably not would have solved everything, but it would have at least know. Okay, we could figure out. Okay, at that point, she doesn't believe what Soren says about Erevos. That's all on her. She's doing everything. That's all on her. But mm. at the same time, like he doesn't get a chance. They try to talk, but he doesn't really get a chance. Yeah, I know. It's just <laughs> that is. Claudia and you don't have what to do what he wants anymore and the dad shows up and he's like Ugh, and he's stun locked so he doesn't actually really get to have that conversation I, mean, um, I, I know but I just say this the lack of you talk about thieves this is a theme here it's like the lack of communication is so bad <laughs> yeah especially in this series um, over a lot of other series and this this one has a little bit of a darker tone in general anyway because like communication is so badly needed but, like everybody's not doing it or at the very least, they're not listening to each other, whether it's the elf nations or, you know what I mean? And like when communication does happen, it's typically centered around Ezra or the Dragon Queen leading the communication and like nobody else seems to be able to talk, like whether they're talking to the dragon, you know, Rex, or if they're doing something else, like, and when they do talk about things, things generally seem to be better. Like when Viren starts to t- talk to Terry, like he sort of comes around and likes them. And um, when Rex talks to everybody, he sort of turns, comes around and likes them until he like flips out and then they're like, they can't get him to talk again. And that's the whole damn problem. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I just like, I just, it's such a, and I know it's on purpose and it's the writing. Yeah. It's 
but it, it just like I, I find myself like ah, <laughs> if you could well, just have a conversation. <laughs> you get mad, but at the same time you're kind of nodding along because you're like, yeah, that's dragon like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get mad at everything here, but I was like, yeah, this just this tracks at this point. Like I said before, yeah. I don't blame the characters because that's not how they're written. But at the same time, it's frustrating because, like, you know, this can be solved so much faster if they just talked. But obviously, mm -hmm. that'd be too easy. So what they, they what they did made sense. But it's just like, mm -hmm. if only Claudia could just if only Claudia just opened her ears and understood what was going on. If Soren literally was better at talking. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If he was better at like, it's the, the the weird the thing the weird thing is too is that the first thing he tells her is that she's wrong. That's the first thing that he says to her when they first see each other after so many years. <laughs> well, that's how you handle a woman. You tell her she's wrong right off the bat, and then she loves that. <laughs> Dang it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> but, but like the first thing he says is that she's on the wrong side, and she's like, "Oh, I knew you'd say that." And it's like, and then the chase ensues. Like, okay, so but nothing was gonna happen there. Then as you said before, as soon as he runs up to um, Varen, his father, he's stun locked. Like he's seen mm -hmm. a ghost. So I was like, yeah, I guess at the same time, there wasn't going to be any talking done to begin with. Yeah. But it just, it's, it's obvious that this is like a, a huge thing is like, no one is talking. And Ezrin and, um, and, and the Dragon Queen are the progenitors of the talk. They're the only Which ones is funny. I'm doing it. It's literally, um, before I let you continue, I'm just saying that, like, there's actually a little big of a meme in Naruto, the anime, of, like, people hate when they talk, because they talk for very long, just the time, and they call it talk Jutsu. It's essentially what he's doing here. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally Esmond's power. Talk Nujutsu, it just, like, he talks and everybody just seemingly stops. But, uh, continue. I'm not sure how much more you got left, but continue. No, it's alright. So then, um... The next test is they go through the dark area. It's unclear if they hate light or they eat light or something like that. And um, they're walking through and it's sort of a walk of faith because they have to have all the lights off. But then something goes wrong because this cube starts glowing and then something else starts glowing and there's just like a ton of reactions and then all Actually. the monsters in the entire world are coming after them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> Skip there was something really interesting, and I don't know if it's because you, you didn't think it was interesting or you, the, the, the character that did it wasn't all that interesting. Um, you bring up that, like, uh, they do some things for, you know, and the, the it's like a, it, it seems like, um, it seems like random, but like, what's up with Rayla's little pet? What was that thing that it did? Like, it, it, it almost like it had like a, it, it had like a wormhole or some pocket of space it tossed something into. I haven't gotten to that because that's in a like halfway down my notes still. Okay, sorry. I just wanted. I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, we haven't even gotten close to that yet. Um, the night creatures. One of the cool animation things were like the um, the lack of perspective there for a minute. I know we're in a dark situation, but it's not the darkness that makes them disorienting. It's the fact that they're walking upside down, and the camera is like upside down and then the camera turns around and you realize that they're actually upside down and you were looking at it from the upside down and it, it's very disorienting but very cool at the same time so i was impressed and enjoyed that very much um and then uh and then they come after them and there's a moment here that i it's very lord of the rings did you ever watch um, um the two towers I'm sorry, Lord of the Rings, the original Lord of the Rings movie, not the Two Towers. I'm sorry, but I feel like this is a I feel like a broken record every time you bring up Lord of the Rings. It's that's fine, but do you remember the scene I'm talking about? I've never seen it. As I say, I feel like a broken record. I've never watched oh, Lord of the Rings. I think I like one. Um, oh dear. There's, there's a Balrog scene, and they're in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they're they're trying to be really quiet. And Hobbits, that's like a clown, a clown character, mm -hmm. is messing with a skeleton, like with a, like there's a skeleton laying next to a well, and it's got a helmet on and some armor on, and he, he's messing with one of its fingers or something, and the skeleton by messing with it, the skeleton's head falls backwards, and the helmeted skull 
makes all the noise in the world. And there's like a 15, 20 second long, like, moment where you just see all of the characters cringing at every single sound. I've seen that thing, in other so shows. And, and probably starting a chain reaction of some sort. And you just hear, <laughs> and just, everybody just looks like this is incredibly awkward. I can't believe what's happening here. And Pippin, of course, thinks it's, which is the character, thinks it's awkward. I'm saying this for the audience's sake now because now we've really seen the movie. And uh, and then Gandalf says, fool of a two, can you throw yourself in next time? And they start, and then a huge, like, search party thing, like where the giant troll comes in and and raises all hell. And that's basically the summation of what was going on. Um, but as they're running, the goblins start showing up like swarms. Like swarms that like I've only seen in real life, like ants do. You know what I mean? Where they're just coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where they're just all... They're surrounded on all sides by like at least 3,000 goblins. And they're in the dark and Gandalf's light is the only light, like from his staff, is the only light anywhere. And you just see all these dark figures shrouding around them. And that felt very much like that moment, like when they were there and they're like, because there's even a bridge involved. And uh, like, there's even a bridge over a big dark area involved that they have to get through to get to the other side. And it's ancient and it ends up collapsing later and everything. So you see that moment and I felt very Lord of the Rings by it. And then Zim being another one of the three healthy characters along with the other two, Ezra and the Queen, decides to sacrifice himself to lure them away by flying and like setting off his lightning as bait. Uh, unlike Bates, bait. <laughs> and the thing that was really interesting to me here is that Zim's communication with Ezra is cut off for a moment. I think I remember I, saying that I think what happened there. Sorry, but um, I'm gonna say this and shut up immediately. Uh, I think he may have been communicating with him, but he can only see darkness. Shut up. It's possible, but he says like I can't see. It's possible that it's because he turned off his lightning and flew back. But it was so strange to me that like the way he's disturbed by it, you know, it was sort of a not a long enough moment of tension to have a good payoff it's like they were trying to like get you ready for something later like a payoff that's going to come later so i i saw that and it was very interesting to me um and then they cut straight from that to claudia having a very dark and pessimistic view about how fairies use humans that they've been using them for all of history that they hate they've hated them for all of history we know this stuff isn't true but we see claudia like really Leaning into trying, like, leaning into trying to justify um, the horrible things that she's doing to these living creatures, and while she's doing this, like Soren's reaching out and like a little pink butterfly lands on his hands, and Freddy was telling him he's lost, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, keep going, bitch. I'm gonna watch this butterfly for a minute. You just talk yourself out." Well, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't, I can't make this argument work. Never mind. I'm sure. The amount that, like. It shows how far Soren's come, uh, and how far Claudia's gone. If you know what, I, if you get the difference between the two words, Soren's come. Soren's come so far, and Claudia's gone so far in the in the same period. Soren is an absolute hero now, and Claudia is not is lost. I won't say she's gone, but she's lost. I will say and, that uh, up to this point, I have been I have been exclaiming how confused I am on Claudia. Uh, mm -hmm. It was this scene in particular that made me think, oh great. Well, no longer lost in Claudia. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And I hate it. But um, I think she'd have a nice conversation with Sugar Rocky. So, anyways, the, uh, they go to the third zone, and the third zone is like even easier than the other two because Callum has a, a breeze dome that he can cast to like make sure everybody's cool. And um, he just kind of flips it up. And then the lava is no longer a problem. It was only going to be kind of hot anyway. But now they don't even have to be hot. They can actually take a nap. <laughs> and 
And Callum takes Raylan aside, and Loki asks her, asks her to kill him if he ever gets possessed again, because he doesn't want to be used. And Rayla, not only does she not kill him, but she honks his nose in the way that Mr. Miyagi honks someone's nose in the Karate Kid. Do you remember that? Um, no. Um, there was a scene where, like, Mr. Miyagi beats somebody in a fight, and the guy thinks that he tells him to kill him. And Miyagi reaches back, and the guy braces himself to be, like, killed, and then he just reaches out and gets honks his nose and goes honk and then um you see the same thing later in the, in the series that the karate kid himself does like he copies his his mentor's move and he goes a nose honk instead of killing somebody so callum says really you're gonna have to kill me if that happens again and she does not only doesn't she kill him but she honks his nose like the karate kid and i thought that was kind of cute um callum doesn't want to be on a path of darkness which is an interesting scene to follow right up from um, Soren and Claudia because Soren and Claudia are like on opposite sides and Soren is constantly is continuing to go to the good and Claudia is continuing to go evil and then you have Callum who's like I'm tainted and I don't want to go to the dark side I'm trying to be good but I'm susceptible to corruption and Rayla's like well take a different path then which is like the most infuriating and pointless argument. It's like, oh, you're you're suicidal? Well, just don't kill yourself. Um, it's just like, it's a stupid thing to say, but that's what she says. It's not very helpful. But she does establish that she's not going to be the one to kill him. <laughs> and um, then we see another moment. Go ahead. But the whole thing with, the thing with, it's like, um, that the past that they're on have been dictated by the history that they, that they each know. Claudia has been brainwashed to believe for whatever reason that uh, humans had been uh, persecuted by uh, magical beings because they lacked magic. Now, I don't know how 100% true that is. There's probably some truth in there, but not the truth that she's probably been told to believe. But, I mean, eh. And, I mean... Which is, which is all well and good, but then we have the fact that both Claudia... Claudia has been influenced by... Erebos, and Erebos might be the one that told her all this crap in the first place. I think she said Erebos did, but eh. What? I think she said, I think, I think, at least she says Erebos did, but eh. Yeah. So Erebos is the one that's corrupting Claudia. Like, he's the driving force to corrupting Claudia and bringing her farther and farther down this dark path. Like, it's been shown that he does with tons of wizards otherwise, and so is Soren. Soren's a little bit corrupted in from Claudia, but indirectly, you know what I mean? Like, he's been corrupted and he can't help it now. It was for a good reason, but he took that step down the dark path, and like apparently that's imprinted on him, because certain fairy creatures that are very powerful, like that dragon and Erebos himself, can immediately see the corruption inside of him and, and identify it. Like I think the dragon, first dragon, like could smell it, and we know that Erebos couldn't smell it, but he could easily detect it, and it's a big vulnerability for him now. And for Claudia, she doesn't particularly worry about being the vulnerability because she just wants to save her dad, but like. Again, we have someone that like feels like they're going after a good intention, but is corrupting themselves in the process, and is now vulnerable to evil influence. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's an interesting scene to follow his conversation with Rayla immediately after Claudia and Soren, and showing how different they are at this point, um, as far as redemption potential goes, but also that like Soren finds himself a little bit in between these two, you know. And even, like, a little bit later, like, when um, Claudia comes back and gives the coins back, like, we see an additional step of that. Where, like, once again, like, she's... She tiptoes back over to the light side for a minute and gives the, uh... And gives the coins back. So, yeah. You know what I mean? There's, like, a lot of, like... If you look at the overlying... Other than the story, what are they establishing here about the characters and their growth? Like, there is a little bit of, like compare and contrast going on it's really interesting to, to take apart um and then there's another lord of the rings moment that comes right up right following up the second one with the dark path over the bridge which is like one of the most famous scenes in lord of the ring you have soren trying to drop this magical cube into the lava and he can't make himself do it now in lord of the rings are you familiar with the story enough to know what i'm about to say you talking about the ring? 
Frodo, uh, Isildur, the human, tries to drop the ring in the lava and he can't do it. And he takes the ring for his own. You have the same moment here where Soren tries to drop his cube, which he doesn't really need that much compared to like his other magic. He tries to drop it in there and he can't even give up that piece of power. Uh, of course, then he goes out and gives away his staff, which is his most powerful thing in the next scene. And we see the back and forth of these characters continue, but it is worth thinking about that here he had the opportunity to give up some power for the greater good and just couldn't quite make himself take the step. So there's definitely, in my opinion, like sort of a Lord of the Rings like throw in there that I thought was super interesting. I'm waiting for you to disagree with me. Wow, you think that little of me? <laughs> I can't no, even disagree I, with you because I don't even, I haven't watched Lord of the Rings. I think I'm familiar with the ring scene, but that's seen everywhere. So I, I'm, I was aware of that scene, but um, I just got to give up Precious the entire time as you were talking, so <laughs> don't, don't mind me. So you're saying that you've seen the ring scene? I feel like um, I have. I've seen, either indirectly or, or directly. I, but I feel like I've seen that scene at, at places. So after that, the important things of the um, the episode kind of wind down. Terry, Terry reveals that he chose his name and his full name is Terrestrious. Viren decides that's a good name. Um, Sparkle Sparkle Time Zone, whatever his, his name was. What was it? Sparkle... I think it was Sparkle Puff. Sparkle Wanker or whatever finds Claudia's bag. Um, he literally asked for it the day, but I give it to somebody. He calls him Sparkle Wanker anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the whole he asked me this, and then he just said, oh, I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him a better name. <laughs> Specifically, so I can ignore it when you answer me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Sparkle Tits um, finds Jeez. the bag. What the heck? Is that the, <laughs> is that the fourth Nick? Sorry, I'll just. <laughs> and then the group crosses the lava and sees the door to Recognius. And the lava was like a pretty much a cakewalk, too. And then. Um, Soren is captured as the creature enters and sees Viren. He sees Viren and is horrified and Terry just kind of like waves his hand and frees Claudia. And it's left on the cliffhanger of the main group getting to the door that's about to open and lead them to the dragon, like this big scary ass dragon. And on the other side, um, Soren having the reveal of um, Viren being alive and us watching his like horrified reaction. I mean, which is me specifically, that was real. Um, yeah, this is, which is expected because he thought he was free of him. Yeah, for sure. But it's still, he's still pretty horrified. Let's just put it that way. No, I was, I was agreeing. I was saying that it was as expected. Yeah, well, he was just saying that, okay? <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but, um... So it was a fun episode, but it was mostly... It was an episode that was establishing a lot of things and sort of progressing the plot without um, necessarily changing the world on its own. I enjoyed the episode a lot, um, and I think it's... I think it's a really good lead-up episode to things that are going to be happening in the future just not necessarily in this specific episode. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it defined some things. It also really defined Claudia. Um, it, it's still kind of like, she's still kind of like on that whole edge thing, but it's defined about, you know, she believes what she's doing is correct um, at the expense of the life of the magical creatures because she believes that humans were powerless to begin with. And um, whatever she was told, it kind of shows that you said before, Varen, I didn't even think about Claudia being corrupted by Terrivos, but that actually makes a lot of sense that mm -hmm. he has a way with ma he, it said before, he has a way of ma mages. Um, she clearly was a mage and a really powerful one at that. And he was able to corrupt mm -hmm. her really easily. And 100% a dark mage, too, for what it's worth. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, I never really thought about it, but yeah, it actually makes a lot of sense. He corrupted her. Despite be, despite talking to her, but like he, I guess in a really way. I mean, they said that Arab was, was talking to humans. Uh, 
There's really not much that I can add there, you know. We'll talk about what happens in episode 8. But, um... I think that's about it. Um, the next episode... Did, this episode did a good job leading up to it, even though the dungeon wasn't much of a dungeon. I mean, the next two... This episode happened because the next episodes have to happen, and there's a lot of meat coming up in the next episodes. But it's, it's good. But there's a lot of meat coming on the way from for what's going to happen in the next scenes. I'm aware, so I'm, I'm aware of what happens in episode 8. I haven't seen 9 yet, so... Yeah, there's there's really good things on the way. This isn't this isn't the end of the good stuff by any means. They're just they're just building up to better things coming up. Um so with that, we'll be back next week to talk about um the next episode of my hero on long episode eight of Dragon Prince. Um we're winding up with Dragon Prince. Probably if we continue with every week for every one episode we have like two more weeks of that left and mm -hmm. then we'll be focusing on my hero and then i guess my hero will be ending in march i guess um i'll focus on what's coming up next um i would say what's coming up next right now but we're gonna wait and bring it up when it's pertinent so uh i guess that's what we'll ended here um uh, I guess I don't have much to say. I was kind of waiting for something ridiculous to happen, where it forced me to end it. But apparently, he's giving me he's giving me this freedom to end it now. But uh, before he does something really weird, see you guys next week. Can I end this with one last thought? Sure, go ahead. It's a little poem that I learned once that I want to share with you. Are you ready? I mean, I'm still here. <laughs> The walls in the malls are totally, totally tall.